Hi, in this video, we will learn about the GPT-1. GPT stands for Generative Pre-Training of a Language Model. In order to understand it, we need to know three concepts in this name, Generative, Pre-Training, and a Language Model. Let's understand what the language model is first. Language model is a model which predicts next token using given tokens. The most easiest example should be search term recommendation. Say for example, you are looking for YouTube deep learning tutorials. When you type YouTube in the search box, you can see there are multiple key suggestions and these suggestions are the prediction of language model with an input as YouTube. The more input, the better prediction. When you type YouTube deep, you can see more relevant predictions by language model. And once you give one more input, you can see the language model predicts even better results. Okay, then why language model for GPT? That is the essential question we want to get from this video. The most benefit of language model is that you don't need human labeling for each training. That is huge since human labeling is really expensive and time-consuming job. But since language model's objective is just predicting next token, as you can see from this slide, without human, you can automatically generate your train data's label. This is all you need to know about the language model. Now let's talk about generative training. There are two types of machine learning training. One is the generative model training and the other one is the discriminative model training. The language model training we just saw is the generative model training. On the other hand, typically most of the machine learning practitioners are familiar with the discriminative model training. Well, the one of the most popular example of discriminative model training is the predicting Titanic survivors using their age, sex, fair information, etc. Discriminative model works well with small data set. Small data is comparably easy to human label and comparably easy to find patterns during model training. Guess what could be the question mark position label? It seems the question mark position data should be read. Now let me visualize the real distribution. After knowing the fact, we can think the question mark should be blue. Here you can find the discriminate model can be easily overfitted without enough data. Generative model is really powerful with enough data as you saw from previous slide. Obviously, the generative model train takes a long time to train since it requires more data. If you want to understand the mathematical detail of generative and discriminative training, you can watch my generative model versus discriminative model video for more detail. But I believe these few slides had enough concepts for generative model to move forward to the next slide. Coming back to GPT-1, we learned GPT-1 doesn't need human label since we just used the next token as a label for previous tokens. And you know what? There are tons of text in the internet. This is likely you already have tons of labeled data to train your language model. The next concept we should know is pre-training from its name. You remember the GPT stands for generative pre-training of a language model. GPT is not just a language model. In other words, GPT is not only predicting next token, but also you can use GPT-1 for natural language inference, question answering, semantic similarity, and classification. GPT-1 proved that just pre-training of language model with huge amount of data can be reused for specific NLP tasks without additional architecture change or addition. Basically, there are two steps for GPT-1 to perform multiple NLP tasks. First is in language model training, which they call pre-training of a language model. And second is fine-tuning the language model uh, with specific data but no additional node or layers onto pre-trained language model. Let me talk about a later slide 
uh, after we understand why GPT-1 chose the transformer decoder as its main design. So what is a transformer? Transformer is introduced in the attention is all you need paper. And the key takeaway are first, it uses attention rather than the sequence. Second, since it uses attention rather than the sequence of inputs, transformer could compute all inputs by at once by matrix multiplication. Thirdly, the architecture is encoder and decoder architecture. And fourth, it could achieve state of art on the English to German and the English to French machine translation. The big change comparing with the trend before the transformer is the attention layer. Encoder and decoder architecture with RNN have been trending in machine translation already, as you can see from this left side. And the transformer replaced RNN with attention layer. Let's have a look how the traditional encoder and decoder architecture with RNN cell works. The first token comes in and output stage. Then the second token comes in and the RNN cell at this position will use previous state and the current input for each output. Third token comes in just like previous step. The RNN cell uses previous state and the current input to output contextualized output. And this will repeat until the end of the tokens. Now you see the last output from the RNN cell. Traditionally, the last output and each RNN output are going attention layer to generate the first input to the decoder's first RNN cell. The first RNN cell in decoder uses a special token start with attention value to generate the first output token. Then the first output token from decoder and all encoder's RNN cell outputs are going to attention to generate input value to second decoder's RNN cell. And the second RNN cell from decoder uses attention value with previous RNN cells output to generate the current RNN output. These steps will be repeated until the RNN cell generates special token end. If you are interested in more detail about encoder decoder architecture, I have explained mathematical detail in another video, so feel free to watch in case you want. Transformer doesn't use RNN cell, so there is no sequence of calculation. Instead, Transformer uses positional encoding so model still can understand where the token positioned without RNN cell. You should feel similar concept as previous encoder-decoder design. Yes, just like the transformer's paper name, attention is all you need without RNN cell, but it keeps using encoder-decoder architecture. Decoder also doesn't use RNN cell. Instead, the decoder also uses positional encoding and attention layer to generate the output token. Just like general encoder-decoder design, transformer also stop generating output once it generates end special token. Transformer's attention layer is not a single layer, but having multiple layers for generalized decision. We call it multi-head attention. And there are skip connections just like this slide. The skip connection has two benefits for transformer. While higher level token might have too abstract semantic information, by having skip connection, we could deliver lower layers original semantic information to the higher level very efficiently. Secondly, it is proven that the skip connection helps successful training, especially for the deep learning model with many layers by reducing gradient vanishing problem. We simply can call the multi-head attention with a fully connected layer in encoder as encoder block and the same set in the decoder as a decoder block. The original transformer from the attention is all you need research paper used the six sets of encoder and the six sets of the decoder blocks. And you can see the transformer replaced the best score on the machine translation. Importantly, this was not the end, it was even just the beginning of NLP innovation with attention.
They already knew the potential of attention-based model and stated in the research paper, and now in 2020, transformer encoder model, which is the BERT, and the transformer decoder model, which is the GPT, are currently leading the NLP to the next level. If you are interested in transformer with more detail, I have a separate video for it, so please visit if you need but I think this amount of conceptual understanding of transformer should be enough to understand GPT-1 in next slide. Let's deep dive on GPT-1. While transformer focused on machine translation, GPT-1 focused on more NLP tasks such as natural language inference, question answering, semantic similarity, and classification. Natural language inference is a task to predict the relation of the two different sentences. Here are example. If the truth of one sentence implies the truth of the other sentence, the relation between those sentences is referred to as entailment. If one sentence is true, the other is necessarily false. This kind of relationship is referred as a contradiction. Question answering task is predicting the answer for the question in given context. Semantic similarity is to predicting if given sentences are similar. Classification is classifying sentence into predefined class. The key point of GPT-1 is that the language model pre-trained with main data followed by the discriminative fine-tuning on each task resulted in the improved scores on these various NLP tasks. As you can see from the paper, the language model training equation is just like the traditional language model training equation. And the design is the transformer decoder design. After language model training with unlabeled data, all you need is just fine-tuning with specific task labeled data without changing or adding complex layers after the language model. Let me give you one example of how we train entailment with GPT-1. First, you can see there is no change in the network. You only see the change in the input and output. During fine-tuning for entailment, the input is just concatenated two sentences which is delimited by the special character and the network will be fine-tuned by label for this train data. So here you can see the big difference with the trend before the GPT-1. While the previous trend needed the task-specific model for fine-tuning, GPT-1 does not need the task-specific model. While task-specific model introduces the significant amount of the task-specific customization, GPT-1 simply removed this but achieved better performance with pre-trained language model by so much trained data with comparatively small fine-tuning. Last but not least, GPT-1 uses advanced tokenization than just word token or just character token, which is called byte pair encoding which compress most common pair of characters as you can see from this slide. Bipair encoding has the advantage of word embedding as well as the character embedding. The most benefit of word embedding is the similarity between words, but the disadvantage is that the word embedding has a chance to generate unknown vector for the unseen word. Character embedding's advantage is less chance of the unknown vector for the real words, but the less similarity between the words. For example, in this slide, hack and able are frequent words, so by splitting hackable to hack and able, the model can infer from the meaning of the hack and able vector, and definitely it should have the better performance than the model converted hackable as unknown vector. This is it. Here is the most important takeaway. First, GPT-1 uses transformer decoder design. Second, GPT-1's performance is based on the language model training with diverse large amount of unlabeled data. Three, GPT-1 can be fine-tuned for specific tasks without additional task-specific model. Last but not least, 
GPT-1 uses subword tokenization, which is called byte pair encoding. All information are from the research paper I noted in this slide. Thanks for watching. See you on the next video.